Okay, so Sarah, I see you eat soup every day at work. Why are you eating soup every day? That's because I love to cook soup. So you make the soup? Yes, it's very easy to make. So you cook it and then you just bring it to work every day? Yeah, I just make a lot on Monday and then I bring it to work every day of the week. Oh, nice. So how do you make the soup? What's your secret? Well, I like to cook very easy. So I buy meat that's already cut up, usually chicken, and then some rice, usually brown rice, and then I buy some vegetables. So after I bought the ingredients, I chop them up and then and I put them all together in water until boils and add some seasoning. Okay, so you say the water boils. As soon as the water boils, that when you put in all the ingredients? Yes, that's right. So you don't put the ingredients before the water boils. No, I guess. It's just easier for the water to be hot because then the vegetables and the meat cook a little faster. So, how do you give the soup flavoring? I usually add salt and pepper, maybe some garlic, and depending on the type of soup, either maybe some soy sauce or lemon juice. Okay, do you put in the flavoring after you put in the in the ingredients or before you put in the ingredients maybe after but usually write a bottle at the same time okay so i just put everything it at one time in at one time and then up uh, and then after you cook the soup do you put the soup in the refrigerator do you let it sit outside? I usually eat some right then, and I also put it in containers for the week. But I let sit it in the containers out on the counter for a while for it to cool before I put in the refrigerator. All right, and so you don't put it in the refrigerator until it is cool until it's about room temperature. Okay, nice. And then, how do you heat it up? Do you heat it up in a, a pot or do you heat it up in microwave? In the microwave, it's the easiest. Yeah, nice. So you make enough for five meals? Maybe sometimes. If I think I'll get Tired to of eating it during the week then meal then maybe I'll just make enough for three or four meals. But if it's some kind that I think is really delicious and I know I want to eat it every day, then I'll make a lot. Well, if that happens when you make the soup, when you make the soup, you can make it for six or seven and give me a bowl, a bowl. Okay, I'll do that next time. Oh great, thanks. Part 2 1. When is Steve going out with Jennifer? On Saturday night. 2. Where is the movie theater? On the, on the Pine Street, turn left. The movie theater is the second building on the right, next to the church. 3. What is the favorite restaurant? And why does the restaurant become, become favorite? The Pink Flamingo, because they serve excellent Spanish food. 4. Where is the location of the favorite restaurant? Turn left on the 3rd street and drive east. The Pink Flamingo is the building just before the river on the left side. 
five. Rental the conversation. Hi Renee, do you happen to know where the movie theater is downtown? The one near the hospital. Yeah, why do you want to know? Well, on Monday, I asked Jennifer out on a date for this coming Saturday night. Wow, you've really been saying a lot of her lately. Sounds great. Okay, write down this direction so you don't get lost. Okay, go ahead. First, drive down First Street going west. Cross the river and keep going straight until Pine Street. Until Pine Street, right? Right. Then turn left. And the movie theater is the second building on the right. It's the next it's next to the church. Second building on the right. Got it. Now, can you recommend any nice restaurant? Yeah, the Pink Flamingo serves excellent Spanish food. Well, where's that? Well, starting from the movie theater, go south on Pine Street, cross Second Street, and drive to Third Street. You will see a parking lot on the left side of the street. Okay, so far, a parking lot, a parking lot on the left. Okay, then what? Okay, then turn left on the third street and drive east. The, fly, the pink flamingo is the building just before the river on the left side. I think it's open. I think it's open weekdays from ten thirty in the morning to eleven thirty at night, but it stays open until midnight on the weekdays. Okay, I think I've driven by there before. Oh, last thing, where can I buy some flowers? We are going out to celebrate Jennifer's birthday. Well, the only florist I know is in front of the stadium on 2nd Street. Try that one. Great, thanks a lot. Part 3 The Dog and the Sparrow by the Brothers Kim Grimm Read by Ricky Kistner A shepherd's dog had a master who took no care of him, but often let him suffer the greatest hunger. At last, he could bear it no longer, so he took to his heels, and off he ran in a very sad and sorrowful mood. On the road, he met a sparrow that said to him, Why are you so sad, my friend? Because, said the dog, I'm very, very hungry and have nothing to eat. If that be all, answered the sparrow, Come with, it, come with me into the next town, and I will soon find your, your plenty of food. So one, they went together into the town, and as they passed by a butcher's, sh butcher's shop, the sparrow said to the dog, Stand there a little while till I pick you down a piece of meat. So the sparrow perched upon the shelf, and having the first looked carefully about her to see if anyone was watching her, she picked and scratched at a stick that lay upon the, the edge of the shelf, till at last down it fell. Then the dog snapped it up and scrambled any oh, scrambled away with it into a corner, where he soon ate it all up. Well, the sparrow said, said the sparrow, you shall have some more if you will. So come with me to the next shop and I will pack you down another stick. When the dog had eaten these two, the sparrow said to him, Well, my good friend, have you had enough now? 
I have had plenty of meat, answered he. But I should like to have a piece of bread to eat after it. Come with me then, said the sparrow, and you shall soon, and you shall soon have that too. So, she took him to a baker's shop, and a peck at two rolls that lay in the window, till they fell down. And as the dog still. And as the dog still whisked for more, she took him to another shop and packed down some more for him. When that was eaten, the sparrow asked him whether he had enough. He had had enough now. Yes, said he. And now let us take a walk a little way out of the town. So they both went out, went out upon the high road. But as the weather was warm, they had not gone for, they had not gone for far before the dog said, "I'm very much tired. I should like to take a nap." Very well, answered the sparrow. Do so, and in the meantime, meantime, I will peer, I will perch upon that bus. So the dog stretched himself out on the road, and fell asleep. And fell fast asleep. Whilst, whilst he slept, there came by a carter with a cart drawn by the by three horses and loaded with two casks of wine. The sparrow, seeing that the carter did no turn out of the way, but would go on in the track in which the dog lay. So as to drive over him, called out, "Stop, stop, Mister Carter, or it shall be the worse for you." But the Carter grumbling to himself, "You make it the worse for me, indeed. Why can what can you do?" Cracked his whip, cracked his whip, that drove his his cart over the poor dog, so that the wheel crossed the do, crossed him to death. There, cried the sparrow, to cruel villain, to hast kill my friend the dog. Now, mind what I say. This deed of time shall shall cost thee all thou art worth. Do your worst and welcome," said the brute. "What harm can do you do me?" And passed on. But the sparrow crouched under the tilt of the cart, and pecked at the bone of one of the casks till she loosened, loosened it, and then all the wine ran out without the carter seeing it. At last, he looked around. He looked around, and saw that the cart was dripping and the cask quite empty. What an unlucky wretch I am! Cried he, "No bread enough yet," said the sparrow, as she alighted upon the head of one of the horses, and pecked at him till he reared up and kicked. When the carter saw this, he drew out his cudgel and aimed a blow at the sparrow, meaning to kill her, but she flew away, and the blow. Flew, fell upon the poor horse, had, with such force, that he fell down dead. Unlucky wretch that I am! cried he. Not wretch enough yet, said the sparrow. And as the carter went on with the other two horses, she again crept under the tail of the cart and pecked out. The bung on the second cask, so that all the wine ran out. When the carter saw this, he again cried out, "Miserable wretch that I am!" But the sparrow answered, "No wretch enough yet," and perched on the head of the second horse and pecked at him too. The carter ran 
up and struck at her again with his with his hatchet, but away she flew, and the blow fell upon the second horse and killed him on the spot. Unlucky wretch that I am, said he, not wretch enough yet, said the sparrow, and perching upon the third horse, she began to peck him too. The carter was met with fury, and without looking about him, or caring what he was about, struck again at the sparrow, but killed his third horse, as he done for other as he done to done the other two. Alas, miserable wretch that I am, said cried he. Not wretch enough yet, answered the sparrow, as he as she flew away. Now will I plague you and punish thee at thy own house. The carter were forced at last to over to leave his cart behind him. And to go home overflowing with rich and fake stations. Alas, said he to his wife. What ill luck has befallen me? My wine is all spilled, and my horses all three dead. Alas, husband, replied she. And a wicked bird has come into the house, and has brought with her all the birds. In the world, I'm sure, and they have fallen upon our corn in the loft, and are eating it up at such a rate. We ran the husband upstairs and saw thousands of birds sitting upon the floor eating up his corn, with the sparrow in the in the midst of them. Unlucky wretch that I am! cried the carter. For he saw that the corn was almost gone, all gone, not rent enough yet," said the sparrow. "Thy cruelty shall cost thee thy life, life yet," and away she flew. The carter, seeing that he had thus lost all the all that he had, went down into his kitchen and was still not sorry for what he had done, but said himself. Angrily and so killing in the chimney corner, but the sparrow sat on the outside of the window and cried, "Carter, thy cruelty shall cost thee li thy life." With that he jumped in a rage, seized his hatchet, and threw it at the sparrow, but it missed her and only broke the window. The sparrow now hopped in, perched upon the window seat, and cried, "Carter, it shall cost thee thy life." Then he became mad and blind with rage, and struck in the, struck the window seat with such force that he cleft it in two. And as the sparrow flew from place to place, the carter and his wife were so furious. That they broke all their furniture, glasses, chairs, fences, the table, and at the last the walls, without touching the birds at all. In the end, however, they caught her, and the wife said, "Shit, shall I, shall I kill her at once?" "No," cried he. "That is letting her off." Are off too easily. She shall die a a much more cruel death. I will eat her. But the sparrow began to flutter, flutter about, and stretch out her neck and cried, "Carter, it shall cost thee thy life yet." With that, he could wait no longer, so he gave his wife wife the hatchet and cried. Wife, strike at the bird and kill her in my and kill her in my hand. And the wife struck, but she missed her aim and hit her husband on the head, so that he fell down dead.
and the sparrow flew quietly home to her nest. The end of the of the dog and the sparrow by the brothers Grimm, read by Ricky Kisner.